Greetings, my name is Thomas Beale. I'm the CTO of Ocean Informatics and one of the architects of OpenAir. This is part two in the ADO 1.5 course and we're going to look at formalism basics and we'll have a fly through of some archetypes just to get a feel for how these interesting artifacts work. The structure of what we'll look at is as follows. We'll have a look at uh, an example and then we'll have a quick look at the various parts of an archetype without going in too deeply. So the identifier, the general structure, what constraining is, because that's one of the key concepts of archetypes, the ontology section, a uh, quick look at binding, and then something called rules and annotations. In order to explain things in this course, I'm going to be using a few different ways uh, of doing that. So one of them is ADL syntax. You can see it there, colorized in an editor. Uh, there are editor modes for a number of text editors which enable ADL to be viewed in this way. So we'll get to get a feel for the ADL syntax, and sometimes it's the easiest way to explain things. Sometimes I'll use the ADL workbench tool, which some of you would be familiar with, and that allows us to visualize things uh, and manipulate them more easily than just looking at pure syntax. Sometimes we'll look at mind maps which uh, usually are taken from the clinical knowledge manager at openair.org and there's an example of uh, one for adverse reaction archetype. Mind maps give us a nice uh, very clean way of looking at the essential characteristics of an archetype without worrying about a lot of the technical details. Of course, since this is a, a technical course, we will look at the UML models of the archetype object model, and uh, I'll give a quick overview uh, of what's going on in those models without going in too deeply. Obviously, these models aren't simple, and there's a lot of software engineering detail implicated, which is uh, beyond the scope of this course. There are the specifications, so the URLs of uh, the current drafts of the relevant specifications are there. ADL 1.5, AOM 1.5, uh, a minor additional specification called the Open Air Archetype Profile, uh, <coughs> and lastly the Common Information Model, which contains a lot of common patterns used in Open Air. Some of those patterns are used in archetypes, for example, language translations and annotations. I encourage you to investigate things for yourself and to do that the ADO Workbench tool is one useful uh, way to get started. There's quite a lot of information on the help site which enables you to find archetypes and also use the tool. The archetype editor tool uh, is also there and uh, that is the tool which clinical archetype authors tend to use. I haven't used it much here because most of what we're doing is looking at how things work technically, that is, behind the scenes. Let's just have a, a little bit of context. Let's remind ourselves of the big picture. In the last installment, I showed this picture which just situates archetypes with respect to reference model, and it also includes something called templates, which is just a kind of archetype which has a slightly different functional purpose. Uh, then we mentioned these so-called downstream products, the operational templates and uh, various kinds of software engineering artifacts for building systems. What we'll concentrate on in this installment is archetypes uh, and a little bit of templates. So one of the slides in the previous installment was uh, to do with levels of semantic definition we know that there's the reference model. We said that archetypes were to do with data points and groups. It's a kind of reusable definition concept. For example, defining what does a blood sugar uh, data point look like, or a set of data points for recording pain. These definitions are independent of context of use. In other words, independent of particular applications or clinical settings. Templates are the layer on top, and we'll concentrate on them in later installments. So, 
let's have a fly through of some archetypes. We've got a very minimal archetype on the screen there, in fact it's called minimal. If you see down the left hand side you've got in purple the keywords or the key keywords uh, which define the sections of the archetype in the ADL syntax. So the first one just introduces the fact that it is an archetype because it could also say template there. It gives the ID, it says the ADL version, and the next piece is language, uh, saying what language was this archetype originally authored in. Obviously it has to be authored in some language. Uh, in the description section there's a lot of what most people might think of as metadata, so information about the original author, a lot of details about the archetype, life cycle state, and so on. The definition section comes next, and that's the interesting mathematical bit. That's where all the semantics of the archetype are. You can see here that the definition starts off with uh, address, and that corresponds, as you might suspect, to a class called address. And if you look up at the top there at the ID, you might guess that it's a class called address within a demographic model or package published by OpenAir, which is exactly what it is. Lastly, the ontology section, uh, not named because it is an ontology, but named that way because the intention is to connect to ontology and terminology resources. Uh, it does define local terms for use within the archetype. It also provides a place where bindings to external ontologies and terminologies are made. So just to recapitulate on that, the general structure, you can see again the main keywords down the left in purple, and the uh, optional sections are in, in grey there, in light colours. And so an archetype at a minimum is going to have the archetype section, the language section, the description section, a definition section, and an ontology section. This is the UML model of the archetype class and some of the peripheral classes. That's from the AOM 1.5 spec uh, section 4. You can already start to see some of the things that you've seen uh, on the earlier slides. So if you look in the archetype class you'll see some uh, items to do with identification, ADL version and so on. There's a, there's a bit of complexity in this class so I'm not going to go into it here. It just uh, gives you the idea that that class exists and that the pieces uh, you can see down to the right uh, rules, definition uh, and so on uh, are defined as parts of this model and we'll look at the definitions of uh, the UML definitions of those uh, subordinate parts of the model. You can see at the top that the archetype class inherits from a class called authored resource from the common information model in OpenAir. That's where it picks up quite a bit of uh, generic semantics to do with translations and language. So we saw an archetype uh, right at the top there was an identifier which you can see on the screen. So let's look at the parts of the identifier. The first thing that you might be drawn to and you can probably guess is this address and you might guess it's a reference model class. In other words a normal class from an information model we tend to call it the reference model in uh, health IT. So this archetype is an archetype based on that reference model class. Now just to tell us uh, where or whose uh, model, wh whose class this is, we want to identify a package, uh, in this case demographic, and you can think of this as indicating which reference model. Uh, you can think of a, a top level package as being a reference model. In OpenAir, for example, we tend to talk about the demographic and EHR reference models. Other uh, standards bodies and organizations might publish multiple models so they need to be identified in the archetype. We also identify who is the publisher so this is OpenAir's demographic address. Uh, it would be easy to imagine HL7 or some other 
ISO, for example, having some demographic model with an address class, so we have to also include the publisher. We have a domain concept short identifier. You can think of this as a, a simple uh, mnemonic identifier. It just aids uh, understanding identifiers by humans and any real meaning is actually uh, established elsewhere within the archetype. We have a major version as part of the identifier. That means that archetypes with a different major version are in fact a different archetype even though logically it's the same archetype uh, but a, uh, an evolution of a previous version and of course we'll explain later on exactly how the versioning works. In ADO 1.5 we've added in uh, the namespace part of the identifier. It's an optional part and you can think of this as whose archetype. So the part in the middle is whose reference model, this part is whose archetype. This enables two different organizations who might build their idea of, for example, the blood pressure archetype based on exactly the same reference model published by the same uh, organization but let's say there's an Australian version, a UK version and a Swedish version of the blood pressure archetype. The namespace is how we distinguish those three archetypes. UIDs can also be used and in the future uh, may well become mandatory on archetypes as well as the structured identifier. So let's just dive straight in and have a think about what we call the definition of the archetype because this is the intellectually difficult bit to, to get your mind around. The first way of thinking about it, the basic way of thinking about it, is that it's constraints on a reference model. Now a reference model uh, is an example that you can see on the right. So it's a normal, it's expressed here as a UML model. It's an address whose details are some sort of structure one of the subtypes of the structure is called item tree. It has some pieces inside which are clusters and elements which happen to be subclasses of a, an abstract class called item and elements, which is some sort of leaf uh, element, contains uh, data value, uh, an attribute or property value of type data value and the class data value has numerous uh, descendants such as dates, times, booleans, texts, quantities and so on. So on the left in this definition part we want to concentrate on the items in green. You can see address, details, item tree, items, cluster and now you can probably notice that these pieces actually correspond to exactly these p uh, the certain classes and attributes on the right hand side in the reference model. So this is the first basic thing to understand about archetypes. Archetypes refer to classes and properties from information models or reference models. So you can always read down the the left hand side of the uh, definition part of an archetype and you're guaranteed to be looking at class names and property names from an actual information model. Now it might be one that nobody's written yet, it's, it's not impossible to write an archetype uh, purely independently of a reference model, but the implication is that there is actually a reference model there. So a reference model or an information model in general and specifically any uh, very generic one such as the one you can see on the screen here normally uh, implies billions of possible instance structures. It's easy to see how to build huge numbers of, of variations of instances based on this one little reference model. So the archetype's job is to constrain all of those possible structures uh, to just a few that correspond, you know, that have some sort of semantic meaning uh, that we're interested in. So how does that really work? So we, we build a particular structure, that means we made some choices. You'll see, for example, that, we just go backwards a little bit, you'll see that the item 
tree class is mentioned here, address details item tree. Now address details is structurally uh, specified to be of type item structure. Item tree is a particular uh, uh, descendant class. So this is a, a dynamic binding idea. We've chosen a particular subclass uh, at this point in the structure and the same thing here with items cluster and so on. So we have our structure, uh, our archetype. We define the meanings of these nodes. So in that structure you see a conjunction of the object, class names, address, item tree and so on, and these funny looking codes in magenta. So in the ontology part of the archetype we define the meanings of those codes. So that element uh, object there we're assigning a meaning of, if we look down here, its address line AT0003. If we look at that in the ADL workbench you'll see uh, essentially the same structure just visualized a bit differently. Uh, so we still have address, details, item, tree, items, cluster, etc, etc. And a slightly more friendly version which you can obtain just by clicking on uh, the right control just off screen in this tool. So you can see address, details, items, uh, it's an item structure, it just happens to have a property called items, address line group. So the view here is reasonably friendly to a domain expert. Obviously it's still fairly technical and you tend to get, or well you can get, deep structures and repetitions of names like the word items there. These are pretty ty typical artifacts of uh, technical models. So let's just go and have a look how this really works. We'll just take a little tiny piece out of the middle of that model, element. The element is a class from that reference model that you saw before. AT0003 is a code uh, from the ontology section of the archetype. So structurally what's happening, you can, if we just forget about the AT0003, we've got element, matches, and then some curly brackets, and then inside there, value, which is uh, one of the properties of the element class, value matches, and then something inside the curly brackets, and so on. So the way to understand this is, this is defining an element constraint that matches any element data instance whose structure conforms to what's inside the outermost curly brackets. That is, conforms to means has an attribute value whose uh, value matches the next constraint down, which is the DV text constraint that matches uh, a DV text data inter instance and so on. So we can think of it as a data instance possibility definition. This little piece of ADL code there is saying, is matching of, of all of the vast possibilities of element instances, it's matching only element instances that have a DV text value. Now, the DV text part it says DV text matches star, that means matches anything, so it's not a very heavy constraint. Obviously a lot of instances would match this, but an element containing a DV quantity or some other data type isn't going to match this. The second thing that we've got here is the conjunction of the element uh, class name and the AT code, and that is the magic that tells us what the meaning of that particular element instance is in the larger structure. Now something else basic to understand is we only constrain things that we want to constrain. So the archetype part, the archetype that we've just seen, corresponds to the upper area of this picture here. Now you can see another bunch of attributes here, attributes properties, I'm using them interchangeably. Uh, these are attributes of uh, the element class and these aren't constrained, they're just turned on in the tool by the R invisibility controls. So you can see uh, 
name, link, snob, flavor, feeder order, and so on. These are all uh, <coughs> properties that exist in the class element from the reference model but don't happen to be constrained. This tool is enabling you to see what has been constrained, which is the top part, and if you use these visibility controls you can see other parts of the reference model that haven't been constrained. If you were editing an archetype, obviously the possibility exists to constrain one of some of these uh, properties here and then they would become part of the archetype. So those things aren't constrained at the moment, but they could be. What are the types of constraint? Well, there's, there's quite a few. There are uh, over and above the, the basic form of uh, just choosing properties and, and class names and so on and saying uh, what comes next. There are slots, internal references, external references, specialization, and of course uh, constraining of leaf data values. So we'll go into all of those properly in the later installments of the course. For now we'll just have a, a quick look by looking at some archetypes. As before, uh, I'm going to show pieces of the, the UML model. So this is from the AOM 1.5 spec. Now it looks horribly complicated. This is the UML model of the, uh, the definition part of an archetype. Now, to make it look a bit less complicated, just look in the middle there, you'll see a class C object. That The C underscore it means constrainer of. So this is a class that is a constrainer of objects. And you'll see in there it has RM type name and a few other interesting things. RM type name and node ID are the two things that you've already seen. The RM type name in the example was address and the node ID was AT0003. So you've already understood two things, the two key things one could argue about uh, nodes within an archetype within this class. Another important class obviously is a similar class but for attributes instead of objects and you can also see here something that you understand now, RM attribute name. So items and value and those attributes you saw, uh, that they're possible values of this RM attribute name property in this class. Another important class is one of the subtypes of C object which is C complex object and you can see that it has uh, a property attributes uh, which enables it to have multiple attributes and if we follow from C attribute back to uh, across the children link we see now that an attribute has children as you would expect. So with these three classes you can see how that tree-like structure of archetypes is built. Now the other uh, types on this diagram are of course a little bit more esoteric and they'll be explained as we go on through the course. Let's have a little look at some real archetypes in the tool just to get a feel for some of the things we've just seen. Uh, I'll go and have a look at a couple of archetypes which are reasonably easy to understand or reasonably well known. Here's one here called Problem. It's about recording uh, patient problems, diagnoses, that kind of thing. And you can see the tree structure of the archetype there. This is using uh, some friendly icons that indicate the type. If we turn the technical mode on we'll see uh, something that we should expect having uh, seen the simple example from before. So a class called evaluation with the property data has under here a set of constraints which says that the data should be an item tree instance whose items should be uh, elements, various elements who which are marked problem, clinical description, and so on. If you put the codes in, you'll remember that the conjunction of the types and the codes enables us to mark different instances of one type as being as having a different meaning. So problem, clinical description, date of initial onset, and so on. So we can see 
there, <coughs> if we look at these, just circulate through those views, an archetype with all its classes, if we hide the classes and hide the codes, then we've got a structure whose meanings start to look very comprehensible to a domain expert, in this case a, a clinical person. Now that's because this archetype is based on an open air class, uh, open air EHR evaluation. If we had a different reference model, perhaps nothing to do with health, then we could easily have an archetype based on that reference model. It could be spare parts for cars or, or something entirely different. So as we can see, uh, I'll turn the technical view back on just to remind us in the early stages of where the classes are. Any of these classes has lower level constraints and you can see element dot value is being constrained to be of type something called DV date. You can guess that that's a, a date leaf type. That's a sensible thing for something that has been called date of initial onset. If we look further down you'll see that uh, reference model type called cluster, which is a sort of tree building type, uh, has been used and constrained uh, in this archetype to represent little groups of items. So location, if we're talking about some uh, problem which is lo physically located somewhere on the body, uh, body site element, location, description and so on. There's another cluster there, etiology. Now it pays to remember the classes you're seeing here just happen to be what's defined in the reference model that we're using. We're using the open air reference model. Uh, this is also essentially for this part here the same as the 13606 reference model. So uh, these classes are specific to those models. We could easily have a different model. We saw earlier on the uh, ability to add things that hadn't been archetyped, in other words, to, to create visibility for things. If we click on that button there, we'll see more of these items that haven't been archetyped, but uh, are available for archetyping is probably the easiest way of thinking about it. All of these things come from the reference model. So, we quickly saw uh, previously the terminology, so as you might guess, this terminology tab shows the different parts, uh, the definitions of these uh, codes that have been used within the definition. And so on. So let's have a look at a, a couple more archetypes. If uh, we turn the domain, turn the technical view off and go into the domain view. We can start sort of thinking about these models the way that a domain specialist would think about them. So a clinical person, obstetric summary, data, something, some sort of tree thing, they won't care about that. They get to items and they see a lot of things that make sense to them. And I'll just show one more by way of a little bit of variety show blood pressure and you'll see in the top part here things that you would expect even if you're not a doctor such as systolic and diastolic pressure which are constrained to be quantities and we'll look into how that kind of constraining is done and uh, other items to do with blood pressure measurement position of the patient confounding factors you'll see a constraint here showing that the position of the patient should be limited to standing, sitting, reclining, and so on. So this is a, a leaf level constraint. There's what we call a slot. So the idea there is that another archetype gets plugged in rather than defining the uh, constraints in line. Something called the rules section is visible in this archetype, and you can see uh, two rules 
a rule for mean arterial pressure and let me just expand out our screen a bit and a rule for uh, pulse pressure and these are the, the trees there are showing the uh, the expression mathematical expression tree that corresponds to these uh, statements so these are mathematical expressions or rules to do with the archetype right so much for the definition section let's have a little look at the ontology section on the screen you can see the uh, the logical structure of the ontology section of an archetype it contains four or potentially four pieces at least one piece that's going to be the term definitions so these are uh, definitions of the local term codes AT these funny little AT codes that you've been seeing in multiple languages uh, potentially also term bindings constraint definitions and constraint bindings all of these pieces will explain in more detail later on of course so the first job of this uh, ontology section is that that term definition section we have to define uh, in a local way all of the meanings of nodes in the archetype definition part that means we get a hundred percent coverage because we, we, we define everything locally bindings to, ter to ontologies external ontologies and terminologies are, are done separately in those binding sections term bindings and constraint bindings that you can see on the left now any of uh, the existing ontologies for example OGMS or uh, FMA, Dolce, other well-known medical and biomedical ontologies have partial coverage and partial connections well-known terminologies such as SNOMED, CT, uh, Low Inc and so on also only have partial coverage of the nodes that tend to be modelled in archetypes the meaning of of uh, concepts in those terminologies and ontologies may not be exactly the same as what's in archetypes either. Uh, another thing that the bindings part of an ontology allows us to do is to bind to what are known as intentional ref sets. These are just subsets of terminology, in other words something like the set of terms uh, which are all lung infections or all blood types. So there's, as we saw quickly before, the ontology section of an archetype. It's the uh, APGAR archetype, and it contains the local definitions of all of the code points in that archetype. Uh, and you can see on the right-hand side a number of bindings as well. So coding, local coding, very simple coding, enables two key things languages and translation and terminology binding just to give you a feel for languages and translation let's go back to our friend the blood pressure archetype you can see it's just displayed there in uh, lin linguistic form I've got the technical view turned off I could have had codes on there but we won't worry about those either so you can see a lot of words now it happens that this archetype has been translated into quite a few languages so we can see German, Deutsch there and there we instantly see all of those words in German uh, Farsi uh, if you're a Russian speaker and so on so how do we make that happen? it's useful to just look at the source of the archetype that is the, the ADL you can see the uh, language section and you can see some information about translations Farsi, German, Netherlands, Chinese and so on. Then you can see in the description parts of the description all of the information that could be uh, linguistically specific not, not names of people and so on but uh, details of descriptive details you can see this is the EN section so that's all in English there's the Japanese section there's the German uh, Chinese Netherlands Russian uh, Farsi uh, I think that's probably Syriac uh, 
and so on. You get to the definition. The definition doesn't know or care about language because there are our little friends, these codes, taking away uh, or, or making the connection elsewhere for meaning uh, with these class names. So of course in the ontology section we again expect to see linguistic elements so term definitions EN and we see the whole thing in English and there we go Japanese and so on all the way through. So it's a very simple approach to enabling language Now it probably makes sense if we look at the description screen uh, of the archetype. It makes sense that the archetype was originally written in some language, in this case English, and that each of the other languages introduced by some translation exercise. Uh, this is some of the metadata of the archetype, so it's showing who was the translator of uh, that that language. Now. This is pretty important because it means that a a, a, an archetype could be authored in any, la any language. It doesn't have to be English. It doesn't even have to be a major language. Then, after the initial authoring, all other languages are seen as translation. So English doesn't specifically have any primacy, although we might guess realistically that quite a few archetypes will be authored in English, since uh, much of the international community does work in English these days. But the formalism doesn't require that. So much for languages. Well, for the moment anyway. Let's have a little look at binding. That is, binding of external terminologies to the internal uh, code points used inside archetypes. You can see on the screen there the ontology section of the blood pressure archetype from OpenAir and for example the AT0000 code meaning blood pressure is bound to a certain SNOMED CT term uh, the same with systolic and diastolic and cuff size only a few bindings have been added just uh, for demonstration purposes we can think of this as a, a simple binding uh, approach which enables or uh, yes allows us to connect one term from an external terminology, one uh, concept, to one internal term. And this is often sufficient uh, for a lot of the codes inside archetypes, particularly ones that name things, also values of things. Uh, this cuff size example here is, a, is the name of something. The value is going to be a particular cuff size, like adult, child, that kind of thing. We can see how these uh, bindings appear in the tool. So here I am back on the blood pressure archetype. You'll see the tooltips show up indicating for systolic and diastolic the SNOMED code bindings. We can also create bindings to paths. In this case, the binding. Uh, means that the external code, such as a SNOMED code here or the LOINC code here, only uh, is valid when bound to this particular path. This happens to be the one minute total APGAR value in the APGAR archetype. That, that code there is bound to the two minute total. If you think about it, one minute total at two minute total uh, because it could have been something else like heart rate or respiratory effort, as you can see here with his low encodes. These are pre-coordinations. That's what's going on in these codes here, whereas the archetype is doing essentially a kind of post-coordination by coordinating the one minute or two minute with total or heart rate respiratory effort and so on. For completeness, we have a quick look at the archetype ontology class uh, UML from the AOM specification. You can see here the uh, the data structures that correspond to term definitions. They're very technical things, a hash of hashes of archetype terms. You don't need to be worried about this at this stage. If you uh, look at the next slide you'll see
what kind of data structures these correspond to. You've already seen these data structures. So like most things in archetypes, what's behind the scenes is actually very simple. Now let's go on to another interesting section of an archetype. That's the rules section. That's an optional optional section and it's a part of an archetype that allows us to write uh, rules or assertions to do with more than one data point in the archetype. Nearly everything that we want to say with respect to a single t uh, node or, or data point in an archetype we do on that node. That's, that's the essential uh, design of the constraint, the constraining formalism uh, th at the core of ADL. Now as soon as you want to include more than one data point such as uh, a rule to do with systolic and diastolic uh, then you need to be able to essentially write some kind of statement. You can see here below the tool has actually uh, detected two statements, one to do with mean arterial pressure and another one to do with pulse pressure. These are both formulae in, uh, that are defined in the archetype. They're just defined using paths. They're rendered here in two ways. One is this expression tree that you can see here with mathematical operators. R is the uh, real domain, meaning real numbers. You can see also it's rendered as a, an expression uh, mean arterial pressure equals diastolic plus a third times systolic minus diastolic and pulse pressure equals that same difference. So these are two uh, formulae that have been added uh, to relate. The next example I'll actually show in the tool. Uh, here we are looking at an archetype for substance use summary. This is the kind of archetype that would be used to record use of alcohol and tobacco and so on. So you can see data points for substance uh, usage status and information about uh, the details of consumption of that, that product. Now if we look at usage status that's to do with whether and uh, how often the substance is being used. We've got current user, former regular, former regular user, former occasional user, never used. So you can imagine that if the person has never used alcohol or never used some other kind of drug or substance, none of this is going to be here. On the other hand, if they're a current user, let's say they're a smoker, then this uh, we might say, we might want to say that these data points here, this consumption summary is required. So this rule that you can see down the bottom has been added for that purpose. It says that, uh, well that's very mathematical looking, it essentially says that the uh, if uh, the usage status matches the term current user, that's the matches symbol, then it implies that the existence of the consumption summary part. Now mathematical minded people will understand that easily enough. We've got a, a natural language rendering usage status matches current user implies exists consumption summary. We can go and have a look at the source of the archetype as well just to see uh, to prove to ourselves that this is real and of course in here you'll see full paths and uh, the relevant piece of ADL syntax to represent the code. The rules part of an archetype of course has its own model. Uh, this is taken from the AOM 1.5 spec. There are probably things that may change on here as some of the uh, subtle elements, aspects of this model are, are still under review and due to its uh, complexity I'm not even going to go into it here. But you know it exists. The next and final section of archetypes that I'm just going to quickly look at is the annotation section. Annotations give you the ability to add node level tagged annotations, in other words uh, annotations for particular purposes such, such as design uh, or marking requirements or some kind of references being added to each individual node of an archetype. 
The current data structure in the current draft of 81.5 is a hash of strings, in other words tagged strings, uh, but this may be upgraded to accommodate coding. So you can see an example there, the annotation section of an archetype has uh, at a certain path, well first of all we've got the language English so we've got to say what language the annotations are in, then at a certain path it has a tag UI and something called pass through. We'll actually find out what that is in a later part of the course. Here's another path here. There are three tags design note, requirements note, medline ref, and uh, in a real archetype, of course, what you see on the right hand side would be something realistic corresponding to those tags. As usual, we have a quick look at the uh, UML model for the annotations part of an archetype comes from the common specification section 7. It's due to the authored resource class. You can see the pieces uh, that make up the annotations capability. This class, this authored resource class, is inherited into the archetype class. You can also see on the side here the translations and descriptive parts. All of that comes in from this authored resource class. And the data structures that we uh, that are defined here, as you've already seen, are essentially simple hash table structures. So it's been a long bit of a long trip. I hope it's been worth it. Let's just summarize the key points. We can say uh, that an archetype is something that we understand in two dimensions. Semantically it's a definition of data points uh, and groups for use in higher level models. So think in terms of a particular domain in health systolic blood pressure or five minute heart rate in the APGAR uh, score archetype. Technically, the second dimension, we think about it more software engineering terms, it's a set of constraints for defining or we can think about it as selecting valid RM reference model instance configurations from among the many billions that would be possible due to the reference model uh, left to its own devices. So you'll find that the semantic view and the technical view, uh, well, they, they resolve to the same underlying formalism, but clinical people or domain specialists will tend to think in the semantic form. Uh, technical people will uh, tend to think more in terms of the machinery underneath. So the features we've seen, uh, there are re reusability. We haven't seen too much of that yet, but we'll see that in the next couple of uh, course installments. There's composability. We quickly saw something called slots. Archetypes are all special, also specializable. They're language independent. They're authored in a language and then uh, translations are added to the archetype to enable them to be to work in that language. And they can bind to terminologies and ontologies. And just to go back to visualizing that picture we saw before, a reference model gives us numerous uh, possible structures. An archetype's job is to constrain the small number that we'd actually like to uh, correspond to the concept of the archetype, blood pressure, APGAR, uh, or something similar. Thanks very much for your attention, and I look forward to you seeing you in the uh, next installments of the course.